Uh, welcome to attending this session. My name is Geitse de Vries. I'm an uh, assistant professor in the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, this is joint work with Marcel Timmer, but as you will learn on during this presentation, it's actually part of a wider team uh, effort. So Klaas de Vries and Anna Moreno are also sitting here. We're working on uh, basically on a large uh, scale uh, effort to construct a database to analyze uh, productivity and growth in Africa over the long run. Uh, so we are working on that. It's an, uh, other, another DFID ESRC funded uh, project. And I'll be presenting uh, one of those uh, papers following from that uh, project. So to start with the motivation for this project, uh, or for this paper, um, uh, that's if, you, if you read the literature, I put up here a couple of, of which books that I like a lot, uh, from Gershenkron to, uh, to Nelson and Phelps to Abramovich and a uh, recent work by Landes. <laughs> If you read this, uh, these books, uh, mostly uh, economic historians, uh, they talk a lot about technology transfer being embodied in, in capital inputs, which can be an important source for uh, productivity growth in, in developing countries. Um, so if you look then at, uh, at the empirical literature that tries to test this, uh, this effect, uh, 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 then if you go to firm level studies, and I put up here a recent one in the American Economic Review by Amiti and Konings for Indonesia, and there's work by Marc Andres Muntler on Brazil. But I could list you, I guess, a hundred more of these papers. Typically, at the firm level, you find very strong effects of, uh, of uh, the transfer of, uh, of, of technologies on uh, productivity growth at, uh, uh, across firms. So firms that import intermediate inputs, import capital goods from, uh, from uh, leading countries, they typically have a, a, a high productivity growth. Uh, but the problem is that if you move to a more aggregate analysis, uh, you tend to find much uh, weaker support for this in the empirical literature. So the, uh, one of the key references is here is their work by Rodriguez and Roderick. Uh, they argue that a lot of trade measures actually do not really find support for, uh, for this, uh, this aggregate effect, uh, which economic historians talk so much about. So what we do in this paper is actually we're going to take a step in between to analyze where this, uh, this uh, discongruence is coming from. What we're going to do is we, uh, we're analyzing technology transfer and explaining growth in, in developing countries, but we take more a meso perspective. So we look at the level of sectors so instead of this firm level, this micro level analysis uh, that, that, that does not match with the aggregate macro uh, analysis, uh, our sector perspective is providing a bridge uh, between these two. And we're using a new data set. So uh, uh, when I submitted the paper, I su submitted specifically uh, for, uh, for Africa. I will, talk, uh, uh, I will talk more in depth about Africa, but basically the data set is broader. It includes 30 uh, countries, nine in Asia, 10 in Latin America, and uh, 11 in, in Africa. And there's annual data uh, for all these countries from 1960 to 2010 uh, for, uh, 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 for uh, uh, value added uh, and for uh, employment. So these two allow you to calculate labor productivity uh, for 10 broad sectors of the total economy. So for each of these countries, for each of these years, for each of these sectors of the total economy, you observe value added and employment. And the value added, we put those into an international perspective using sector-specific PPPs. So if you, if you are aware of the literature, then most of the literature would use aggregate PPPs to calculate productivity levels uh, also across uh, sectors. Uh, but we have been using the uh, latest round of, uh, of the World Bank ICP uh, project uh, to uh, derive uh, sector-specific uh, PPPs. <clears throat> so if we move into uh, the theoretical framework that I consider here, uh, basically what I think of is if you have labor productivity, so it's defined as value added uh, divided by employment, in, in a sector J of a country I, this may increase either because of innovation or because of uh, technology transfer. So this is the uh, distance to the frontier model introduced by Achimoglu and Aguillon in 2006, or at least that's when it was published. So you have the change in productivity here, and you're saying this is related to this gamma IJ, which is basically innovation, or there could be a technology transfer if you're uh, removed from the productivity frontier. 
So the further you're away from a technology frontier, the larger this, uh, this lambda ij can be. It can be a positive effect from uh, technology transfer coming about. And then you can take this, uh, this model and extend it a little further. Uh, the full model is not sh what's shown here, but this is basically the idea that I want to show to you here. Is that, okay, so you have productivity growth and you're going to explain this uh, taking the distance to the frontier, so a kind of convergence uh, effect. Uh, but I'm going to moderate this by the effect that the imports of intermediate inputs can take. So I have my set IJT, which could be the direct effect of imports of intermediate inputs and, and capital goods. And then this set IJT interacted with the distance to the frontier. Yeah, so the further you are away from the frontier, the larger the potential for technology transfer from international trade uh, there could be. So this first effect, uh, the effect of, uh, of uh, changes in, in productivity on changes in uh, distance to the frontier is something that's, that's fairly well known. So just here a scatter plot on, on how, how this looks like in my data set. So if you have here on the x-axis you have the distance to the frontier. So the further you are away from the frontier, the larger the scope for uh, productivity catch-up. And then on the y-axis you see the average labor productivity growth. Yeah, so over this 50-year period, you have the average productivity growth rate, and you see that on this, uh, this, 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 this cloud of dots, you see that it's positively upward sloping, right? So this is the indicating that the further you're away from the frontier, the higher your productivity growth uh, is likely to be. So the frontier is measured by the U.S. Yeah, so you have the sectors in the U.S., their productivity level, and you, uh, uh, you have the productivity level uh, of each of these country sectors in these developing countries. So say agriculture in Tanzania or mining in, uh, in, in India or uh, any of these country sectors. And you uh, translate the value added to uh, the US dollars, the international dollars using this uh, sector specific PPPs. So then you, you can uh, you can take those, so you have your productivity measure, which is on a comparable uh, US dollar measure, and you can put the, those here. So this is the US frontier, and this is the frontier from the, or the productivity level from the developing country. So if this is the US, and this is the developing country, it's the logarithm, so the difference is, uh, is the, the, the potential for technology transfer, right? It's the difference is the gap. Yeah, so that you see here that the further you're on this x-axis, the further you move uh, to the right, the, the further you're away from the frontier. So that's how we measure it. Yeah, so our main data source for this is an update and extension of, of uh, the 10 sector database. It has value added employment data with broad sectors of the total economy. Uh, I worked on this for uh, quite a long time. Uh, an, uh, an early publication was uh, by, uh, in 2009. Uh, but more recently, uh, we have been extending this to, uh, to uh, 11 African countries. Uh, uh, so, um, <coughs> uh, 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 Klaas and, and Anna have been working on this, uh, I myself and, and part of a, of a larger team. So if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, then, then feel free to discuss this with us. Uh, two key points about this database I want to raise. First of all, it's internally consistent. So you have value added and employment that both match with each other. So you take a national accounts concept that you cover the full economy. Uh, that these are internally consistent. They have to be internationally consistent, right? So that you, you're, you know you measure the same thing. If you're talking about agriculture, you're measuring agriculture in all of these countries. And they have to be intertemporally consistent, right? So that over time, you follow this in the same, uh, you follow the same variables using the same <coughs> sources and methods. And then the second point, which is important, it's a, it's a full coverage of the economy. So it tries to include both formal and informal activities. Yeah? So the second speaker will discuss, uh, I just discussed a paper by, by Roderick on unconditional convergence, recently published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. He only looks at informal activities. So here this data set includes both. Uh, this one I just discussed with you also. So these sector-specific PPPs uh, uh, work for the World Bank. 
where you derive this uh, uh, PPPs from the International Comparison Project uh, 2005 round. Uh, only for agriculture, we thought it would be more accurate to use FAO uh, data. And then the trade data so far, this is also not yet published, but it's going to be published. Uh, uh, it's worked by Robert Feenstra, the new version of the Penn World Table, so we have detailed trade data. So what you have typically is trade data that you see the imports, uh, but you don't know where the imports are going to. So are they going to final consumption in the country, or are they actually going to be used by firms in these countries to produce something else? So this trade data by broad economic categories allows you to distinguish between intermediate goods, between uh, capital goods, and between consumption goods. So I'm taking those data. Uh, we're also working on that with Robert Feenstra, so I have the advantage to already be using this data. It's also then a kind of test of this uh, data. And uh, things will become available online uh, starting in, uh, in July. Uh, so via our website at gdc.net, uh, and also the, the, the Penn World uh, Tables uh, website. So here's, a, here's an uh, indication of how, uh, how the productivity gap uh, looks like across our set of developing <coughs> countries. So we take the United States as the, as the frontier country, so we set that as one. I, I, I explained this uh, before, how I derived this level. Uh, so you have 100, and this means that, uh, that for the total economy on average in these developing countries, they're at 17% of, uh, of, of the U.S. Uh, if you look over time, there's a slight uh, catch-up, and I'll discuss a little bit more how this uh, looks like across uh, countries. Uh, but there's substantial variation across sectors. Right? So if you look at, for example, agriculture, uh, then agriculture is, is, uh, is, 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 is further away from the frontier than uh, a, a, a typical uh, 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 services sector. Right? So you have here, uh, if you look here, the agriculture is about a 10%, but a couple of services sectors, they're much closer to the uh, frontier. And of course, you can argue with me about whether particular services sectors you can well measure, right? So some non-market services sectors are much more difficult uh, to measure. Over time, it slightly improved, uh, but this was mainly related to uh, improvements in, the, in services sectors. So workers in developing countries moved to services sectors with somewhat higher productivity levels, so that was causing this, uh, this catch-up for the total economy. But if you look at particular sectors, you do not see this uh, trend. Yes? Sorry, the U.S. is one in 1960, or do you find the U.S. is one in each year? U.S. is the productivity leader throughout, okay. in each year. You find the U.S. is one in each year? Yes. Okay, yes. well, what, about, what about U.S. productivity growth? Yeah, so, uh, so, so this is the U.S. is, is it a frontier indeed. So if, you, if, you, if, if the U.S., basically what you could have here, so, so manufacturing is, is falling behind, right? right? But it's falling behind relative to the frontier. So if you take productivity <coughs> growth data of manufacturing, this is positive for most of the countries. Right. Uh, but the U.S. has been improving its productivity at a faster rate, right? right? So what you would expect is if there's productivity, if there's a productivity level, then you would expect to catch up over time. So you would expect that these developing countries, their productivity growth would be faster. And if that were the case, they would be actually coming closer to the frontier. So it's within year consistent relative to the US. Sorry? It's within year consistent relative to the US. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can think of some sectors where other countries might be leading in terms of productivity, but typically, and also in my entire data set, the U.S. is, uh, is, is leading in most. This is for Africa. For Africa, you can see uh, uh, that, that the gap is typically larger, right? So, uh, so is... So you see, in, instead of about 17 to 20 percent, uh, you have uh, about, uh, uh, about 9 percent. Uh, 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 in agriculture, there's a 50% there's a difference in labor productivity between uh, uh, the U.S. and Africa. Also in manufacturing, it's, it's falling behind. Uh, but what you can see is that, that services also have somewhat relatively higher levels. So people in Africa have been moving to urban areas and uh, largely to uh, uh, services sectors, and this is causing, uh, causing a slight a uh, slight shift in the uh, aggregate uh, productivity level. Yes? Uh, intuitively, um, it's hard for me to see uh, the government intensive sectors not uh, improving as, uh, not falling as, uh, as fast. For 
Oh yes. So you only have five to go, so now I presume you have quite a bit. Oh, to uh, I think I have ten minutes left, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, no, but I, I, I very much appreciate these questions because they're quite clarifying. So indeed, one of the limitations that we still face here is that we do not observe uh, capital, right? So we've been putting a lot of effort into constructing this database on value added and labor, uh, but we're still missing an important input, which is capital. Uh, so you could argue that, okay, so to what extent is that, are there differences with capital and non-capital or less capital intensive sectors, right? So we know that agriculture in the U.S. Is, has become extremely capital intensive uh, uh, and this might be related to this decline in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in, in this, in this respect. Uh, so, um, I do tend to believe, so I, I for a more limited set of countries, we, we also have uh, capital data. So I did these types of analysis in other studies, but I do tend to believe that even if you take capital into account, you, you still observe these types of uh, patterns. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, what I'm doing here in my empirical analysis is that I, I look within uh, sectors over time. So if you, if you, if you take this within, then uh, you're less likely to, right? So, so if there's... Uh, I mean, mining, if you would take the labor productivity level of mining and compare it to agriculture, there will be differences because mining is much more capital intensive to compare to agriculture. So I, I will look within sectors over time. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's another way. But it's, uh, indeed, it's a relevant point uh, that, that, that capital is not taken into account here. So here's the relative productivity level in manufacturing uh, over time uh, from our database. So I took manufacturing... Uh, I took uh, the unweighted average across uh, three regions. Uh, so the green dots, you have, uh, you have Latin America in 1960. Uh, uh, the blue line is, is Africa in, uh, in 1960, and then the red line is, uh, is, uh, is Asia. Uh, what you can see is that at the start of the period, um, uh, Asia and Africa had more or less the same productivity levels, uh, and Latin America was uh, at about 40%. Uh, but you very clearly see this pattern where you had a slight catch up until 1980 and then a long run decline uh, all the way uh, to now. Uh, the same happened in Latin America, so after 1980 it started to decline. In, in Asia you see this opposite pattern. So you have this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this increase in, uh, in, in relative productivity levels uh, over time. So there has been a divergence uh, uh, for, these, uh, for these sectors. <coughs> so, some of the econometrics uh, of this paper. So what I do here is uh, I try to bridge these uh, micro findings on the effect of imported inputs uh, to the uh, uh, more aggregate uh, analysis. Uh, what you see here is uh, if you focus uh, first on this column one, you see that if there's a productivity gap, uh, so the larger the gap, the larger the effect will be on productivity growth. This is the correlation I showed you uh, in the beginning. Um, so that's the positive effect. It's significant across, uh, across all these uh, specifications. But what I do here is for the total economy, I include this role of uh, imports of in inputs. Right? So that's the direct effect it can have on, uh, uh, on innovation. Uh, and then the imports of inputs interacted with the productivity <coughs> gap. So that's a kind of technology uh, transfer potential. So if I do that for the total economy, I do not find any significant effect. And this is also what in a lot of these cross-country macro studies has been found. That there's, uh, that there's a limited role for, for trade uh, in uh, affecting productivity growth. 
Uh, but if I go to the more meso level, then I find that if you look at goods producing sectors, and within goods producing I could look at agriculture and manufacturing, there you do find a positive, very positive and very strongly significant effect of uh, imports of inputs on, uh, on productivity growth. Yeah, so this is in line with all these firm level studies, and most of these firm level studies, they do this for manufacturing uh, firms, right? So here I also find for, this, uh, for these sectors, I find this positive effect. But if you go to particular services sectors, and then I split this up into market and non-market services. So market services are typically somewhat better to measure because they are active on the market, uh, right? So you have retail or you have transport activities, these types you... I mean, uh, measurement is always a matter of degree, as Sri Grilig uh, uh, had put it. Uh, but here you do not find any effect, right? Non-market services, uh, if you, I mean, non-market services like government uh, activities are much more difficult uh, in health and education, much more difficult to measure outputs. I put them separately, but here I also do not find any effects. So what this suggests is that for these sectors you do have a positive effect, for a lot of services you don't, and as a result you also do not observe an effect in the aggregate. And this is, to my, uh, in my opinion, this is providing a bridge in this literature where these uh, effects from the imports of inputs are, uh, are coming from. <clears throat> so as said, uh, uh, this is a pretty robust uh, finding. I tried a couple of other specifications. So further suggestions are welcome. Uh, I used five 10-year averages. Uh, one could argue that there's some uh, endogeneity issues uh, because they're different sectors of the economy. So if other sectors of the economy are growing, then uh, they do not require these inputs to be imported anymore. Uh, so I tried using internal instruments. Uh, uh, still, it's a, it's a, it's a significant finding uh, that it's only in, uh, in, uh, in these goods producing sectors. I included additional controls, so uh, growth at the U.S. Uh, technology frontier, controls for financial development, so credit to GDP, uh, human capital, human capital interacted with the technology, uh, uh, the, the gap, so potentials for, for technology transfer. Uh, my main focus is here on the role of imported inputs, which is, uh, which is uh, robust and uh, significant. If I do this by regions, however, uh, I tend to find a positive effect for Asia and Latin America, but uh, most of the results actually disappear once I do this for Africa. So this is something uh, uh, to discuss perhaps uh, that you, uh, in Africa, I do not find any significant effects uh, of, uh, of the role of trade on, uh, on productivity growth. So I'm concluding here. Uh, uh, so what I did, I used this uh, new database to document trends, productivity and convergence in developing countries. Um, <coughs> uh, there's, uh, this allows you to, to, to analyze where, where this, uh, where this uh, uh, for a more general eco eco uh, equilibrium uh, perspective, where, where, where these uh, changes are coming from. And what we find is that, uh, that imported inputs enhance technology transfer in goods producing sectors, but not in the, uh, for the total economy. And I've argued that this would provide a bridge in the current literature uh, on uh, growth in, uh, in Africa. So thanks for your attention.